this this last semester i was taking anglican history and doctrine with my professor dr jonathan lineball absolutely amazing pro professor and what he what he said was sometimes he goes to some churches and and people say well what do you do here it's like we give you jesus we let you know that you need jesus and here's jesus and they say well what else well you do it in the morning you need jesus here's jesus <laughs> well what else what else is there right. jesus is enough we yeah. are continually reminded i need jesus here's jesus i need jesus here's jesus this is what we need every single day of our lives it's the daily gospel and that's what we continue to proclaim every single day if you want something more you're not looking for jesus because right. jesus is more than you could ever need and he's yeah. more than you could ever want because he is the satisfaction of all of us just as just as first corinthians says he is our salvation he is our propitiation our sanctification and redemption so that everything that we do we don't boast in anyone but god that's that's the heart of it that's the heart of the yeah. christian faith christ and him crucified i don't want to know anything else Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Mere Catholicity podcast. I am your host, as always, Jonah Saller. Before we get into today's episode, I do just want to let you guys know, for the millionth time, I'm sure you're tired of hearing this, but I have a Locals page down below. It's a community of like-minded Catholics that are joining together to enter into a deeper Catholicity in the faith. And so if that's of interest to you, you want to support the work that this channel is doing, and you want to join with like-minded brothers and sisters in Christ, I would recommend clicking the link below. Today, I have the pleasure of having an old friend of mine on, uh, Jeremiah Short, also known as the Black Doctor. And this brother and I go all the way back to sometime like end of 2019, mid-2020. And I just want to say for the record, he is the one who convinced me of infant baptism. So if you're like, Jonah, your theology's nuts, this is the guy to blame. Blame him. So, uh, um, But it is a joy to have Jeremiah back on the channel. Um, today we're really going to be talking about um, the Catholicity of the Reformation, uh, seeing the Reformation as a gift from God to purify the church of some of the accretions that had crept in, and to bring it back, not into a new thing, not into a new way of life, but to the roots of the apostolic deposit that was handed down through Christ and his apostles. And so before we get into this topic and start to unpack it, I do just want to give Jeremiah a moment to introduce himself, let you know who he is, how you can find him, um, as well as kind of where he's at theologically as well. So Jeremiah, could you give a brief introduction? Yes, of course. Uh, for those who know me and those who don't, I am Jeremiah Short, also known as uh, the Black Doctor. Um, I'm 26 years old. Uh, I work at uh, a Presbyterian church as the pastoral intern and interim youth director. Um, but now, uh, since I've been studying Anglicanism for a little bit over three years now, um, I have been convinced of basically arguments of the Episcopacy and have become uh, a sort of reformed high church Anglican. Uh, and so you can find me on things like TikTok. I have uh, 14 and a half K followers there. Um, I just reached over a thousand subscribers on my YouTube channel, also known as The Black Doctor. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram as well as my Patreon. There on my Patreon, I do uh, audiobook uh, readings, uh, audiobook voicings, especially of writings of the early church fathers. Um, uh, you can also find, you know, exclusive live streams that I do and teachings on church history. Uh, I've been going through the early church, walking through uh, church history. We've gotten down to the Greek apologists and the next episode we're going to be uh, talking about, we're going to be talking about Gnosticism. Uh, so we're going to be we're going to be having some really, really good stuff. Uh, but today we're, we're talking about Reformation history and the Catholicity of Reformation history. And it's that's been my my thing. Uh, in in relation to the reform faith and and looking at history, because so so it's I'm really excited for this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Me too, brother. Me too. And I I think many on my channel will appreciate the fact that I'm talking about this because there seems to be an assumption that if you're on the Anglo-Catholic or High Church side of things and you like the smells and bells of ceremonial, 
then you couldn't possibly like anything about the Reformation. But as I think we will show today, that's that's simply not true. true. There were plenty of very high church Anglicans throughout history that clung dearly to many of the doctrines of the Reformation. Um, and so these two things are not incompatible. And so to kind of get this topic going, to start talking about this, I just want to pose the question to you. <clears throat> we call ourselves Catholic. And most people associate that term with Roman Catholicism. And yet when we speak of Catholicism, when we speak of our Catholicity, we don't necessarily mean Roman Catholic. So some people would say, how does Reformed and Catholic go together? How would you right. respond? Yeah, yeah, because uh, as, as you said, a lot of people assume the term Catholic to mean Roman Catholic. And when you do that, you immediately take the full meaning of the term Catholic out of its word. The term Catholic means according to the whole. It means universal. So when you relegate it to only one place, particularly in Rome, in Italy, then you're you're making a, a contradiction. It's like saying a square circle. It's an oxymoron. Right. And so in relation to Catholicity, we are referring to what has been believed by the whole church. Like uh, if you're if you're familiar with church history and if you're familiar with Reformation history, you'll hear this this name uh, continually thrown out vincent of lorenz and he's referring they're referring to the vincentian canon what is believed everywhere always and by all those are the things that we can determine catholicity from and those are the things by which all christians are are defined by and so right. when we come to the issue of catholicity we are referring to the faith that has once for all been delivered to the saints uh, and how Anglicans define Catholicity is what has been believed and what has been practiced by the whole church for the first hundred years of the church before the medieval accretions began to come in, um, before the claims of Rome began to be uh, exalted, where Rome placed itself over the entire church, where the Pope placed himself as the supreme authority over the entire church where thoughts on the Lord's Supper were basically dogmatized to the point where you had to believe in transubstantiation or you weren't a part of the true church <clears throat> because transubstantiation believes, well, well it's it basically making three claims specifically for Rome. Number one, that the Eucharist is a mystery that cannot be understood or defined. Number two, we've understood it and we've defined it in these specific ways. And then number three, you have to believe these or else you're not saved. <laughs> So the, the, the reformed churches continually rejected that, but we were not intending to create a new church. We weren't contending to cut something from the whole cloth. Anglicanism in itself does not proclaim a faith of its own, but proclaims what has always been believed everywhere and by all. And so I really want to begin with this quote from the, the Bishop Lancelot Andrews, a wonderful, wonderful man. He said this. We believe in one canon, reduced to writing by God himself, two testaments, three creeds, four councils, five centuries, and the series of fathers in that period. The centuries that is before Constantine and two after, which determine the boundaries of our faith. It is the universal church in relation to these councils that determine the Catholicity of our faith. So what we want to do especially in promoting the Reformation doctrines, is not cut something out of the whole cloth, but state that this is the faith of our fathers that has been handed down to us. And that's what I want to demonstrate as we, as we go through some of the writings um, of the Reformers in relation to this issue. Does that, does that help, Jonah? Yeah, oh, that, that helps immensely. Um, I, I think a lot of people, when they approach the Reformation, uh, sometimes from within Protestantism, but also from outside without Protestantism, there can be this tendency to characterize or, or paint the caricature of it as being this event in church history where a bunch of people decided, we don't really need the church anymore. All we need is scripture, and we're going to go off and do our own thing. And there's different ways in which this gets articulated, but generally that's kind of the caricature that's given. I don't think people right. realize that the Reformation would not have gotten off the ground in the way that it did if Rome had actually 
desired to have a conversation and move forward with some of the reforms that these people were bringing to the table. It was Rome's rebellion to this and in a unwillingness to talk about this that led to an actual schism and break and fracture. And I think there's problems on both sides of this. There was pride on both sides, things that are a tragedy of history. But the reality is it didn't begin with people saying, hey, we don't want the church anymore. We're going to go our own way. It went it started with people who seriously looking, as you pointed out, they were seriously looking at these early days of the faith, reading the writings of the fathers, reading the creeds, reading these councils, reading the scriptures and saying, something doesn't seem right here in our current context. And the, the, the litmus test for that was an appeal to the Catholic church. <laughs> it wasn't an appeal to private reasoning of scripture. It was an appeal to the Catholic church. And one of, one of my favorite books that I recommend every Anglican read is Bishop John Jewell's Apology for the Church of England. Yep, you got it right there, brother. Awesome. It is so good, <laughs> so good. And one of my favorite things about the book, because, you know, at first I was a little skeptical. I was going, okay, what's he going to do here? Is he going to try to twist things around? All he does is say, here's the claims of Rome. Here's our claims. Here's what the fathers say. Here's what the scriptures say. Yep. And he just shows that clearly Anglicans are seeking to uphold the teachings of the Catholic Church. So could you touch on that? Just the importance of the fact that the appeal of the reformers was back to the early church, not to some Yahoo idea they pulled out of the sky. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I, I really, I really want to touch while we're doing that touch on the point that that you made, where Rome basically shut out all conversation. Like John Jewell points this out himself in relation to the Council of Trent, because he's writing in response to the Council of Trent, he says, at the Council of Trent, where the ambassadors and divines of the princes of Germany, and of the free cities were quite shut out from their company. Neither can we yet forget how Julius the Third, above ten years past, provided warmly by his writing that none of our sort should be suffered to speak at the council. So we couldn't even make our claims there. So instead, we'll make our claim here in relation to the religion. And he says, this is what we're going to do. Further, we do show it plain that God's holy gospel, the ancient bishops, and the primitive church do make on our side. And that we have not without cause left these men, without just cause left these men, the Romans, and rather have returned to the apostles and the old Catholic fathers. And if we shall be found to do the same, not colorfully or craftily, but in good faith before God, truly, honestly, clearly, and plainly, and if they themselves, which fly our doctrine, would be called Catholics, shall manifestly see how all those titles of antiquity, whereof they boast so much, are quite shaken out of their hands, and that there is more pith in this our case than they thought for. So here, what, we're tr what, what John Jewell is trying to say is that we're trying to demonstrate from the very beginning, from the apostles' teachings and tracing the Catholic fathers onwards, that the practices made in Rome are accretions, and that the true and full practice and belief of the church are ours. We believe in the power of, of Christ and the sacraments. We believe in the power of the threefold ministry. We believe everything that the Catholics believe, but reject the things that they have added in order to secure their own authority. That's the point. Right. What, right. We, when we call ourselves Protestants, what we're not calling ourselves is Anabaptists. We're not. We're not saying that the only thing that we have is the Bible, and therefore we're going to bring our own private interpretation. Because Scripture itself says that no revelation was given through private interpretation. Private interpretation is good. However, it is not the very standard upon which we, we do our theology. We, right. we lean on the plain teachings of Scripture. And when Scripture is not clear, or when people debate about Scripture, we look at how it has been interpreted by the ancient fathers, the ones who received the Holy Gospels, and those who have been practicing it for years. They're not infallible, yeah. but they they pretty much knew what they were talking about for the most part. Yeah. 
I, I think this also ties into just the nature of the church. I think sometimes people forget that the church is a mystically united body that is sacramentally joined to our Lord Jesus Christ. And so in a real sense, and I mean, St. Paul explicitly says this, he says we have the mind of Christ. I, I can't really wrap my head around what that fully means. But one thing I know for sure is that it means that through the power of the Holy Spirit, when the church comes together <laughs> and the church talks about things, those things are guided by the promise of the Holy Spirit in such a way that I think in the very least we have to grant it plays a huge evidential weight upon us when we're determining what the truth is and what the truth isn't. Um, and I think this is one of the points, again, that's very important to the nature of Catholicity and the discussion of Catholicity. Protestants mm -hmm. are not casting off the church. We're not taking our Bibles and running off to read them by ourselves. All we are saying is when you take the church and you take the scriptures and you compare that to medieval Roman Catholicism, it doesn't add up. That's it. That's really fundamentally it. And so I, I want to I wanna talk a little bit about specifically the nature of Catholicity, because I could hear somebody say, okay, fair enough. You want to you wanna go back to the early church. You want to go back to the scriptures. You want to cast off accretions. But who gets to judge that, Jeremiah? Who gets to determine what is an accretion and what isn't an accretion? And in the very least, I think it's a fair question to, to propose. How do we not get caught in the Anabaptist idea, which is we need to cast off infant baptism. We need to cast off this because these things are all accretions and they're not holding to the. How do we avoid that extreme while also not going to the extreme of Rome by saying, well, I guess we just need an infallible magisterium. Right. And, and like, this is what the, what, this is what the reformers were doing. They were looking for consensus. They weren't just wondering about, you know, if if one early church father had this wayward opinion, they wouldn't say, well, now this is ancient. We can believe this now. No, they looked to the best authors, the best authors, the most prominent fathers, and their agreement on certain things. And they said, these are the things that we can stake our claim on. And if you disagree with these things, then you're out of the church. But if the church fathers are not completely united on something, you're free to believe it. Like this is this is what they use in relation to the the use of ceremonies, like for example, um, crossing oneself. They were affirmed that you could do that because it was the ancient practice of the church. This is what the church has always done, all the way back to Ignatius, Irenaeus, and Tertullian. But in relation to the full adoration of images, like you you find this in the homily on the peril of idolatry, like. Uh, and, and even in sort of like the oaths that were made by the princes when they took the throne, they claimed to be upholding the Protestant faith and denied the adoration of images as is practiced by Rome, as right. is practiced by Rome. That caveat is explicitly there. So right. there is a valid way there could be, and it has been argued a valid way to rightly appreciate and honor images of Christ, Mary, and the saints, but not in the way that Rome does based on its, its perspective on purgatory. It's uh, all, all of these other things that have been added to that particular theology. Right. So again, Catholicity is based off of the best fathers, their consensus and what has been practiced throughout the entire church. Right. That's how we determine things that we can disagree on and what properly determines Catholicity, going back to Vincent's canon, what has been believed always, everywhere, and by all. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and for example, on Article 22 in the, in the 39 articles, like you said, I think it's, it's very important that a lot of these issues where you go, okay, does that mean that they're denying everything to do with images? Does that mean images have no place in the church, for example? I think it's important to point out, it does say the Romish doctrine. And the fact that the Article 22 is named of purgatory shows that the specific condemnation is the use of images, relics, invocation of the saints, all of these things, as they are tied to the Romish doctrines concerning purgatory. And when you look at that yeah. and then compare that with the rest of church history, 
it becomes completely implausible that this could possibly be Catholic. And so one can agree with that and still, in my opinion, affirm the definition of Nicaea II um, without, without having to say, I have to either throw out the article or and hold to the definition or throw out the definition and hold to the article. I think there's a balance mm -hmm. here, and that balance is found in looking at church history. But I also think we have to exert caution, even when it comes to the claims of ecumenical councils, because you'll mm -hmm. have certain councils that claim to be ecumenical, but aren't. So, for example, we would reject the Council of Trent. We would reject the Roman Catholic councils that claim to be ecumenical or, and are not. And even in Great. a case like Nicaea II, some of the claims of the council, I do think, go a little too far. And I think my basis for saying they go too far is not because I'm trying to use my own private judgment and authority. It's appealing, once again, to the early church. If you can show me the kind of cult use of icons that you find in orthodoxy and in roman catholicism in the early church then i'm all ears and i'm more than willing to submit to that but i can't find it and so again that's to me that consistent anglican approach to what is catholicity is going back and saying is it found in the scriptures is it found in the apostolic witness of that first um like the lancelot andrews quote two testaments three creeds four councils that's kind of our standard of judging orthodoxy and everything that follows that has to line up with those things. And if it's inconsistent or falls off the, off the train at some point, then we not only have the right to reject it, we actually have the duty as Christians to reject it. Um, so do you, do you want to talk a little bit more about that and just ecumenical councils and their authority? Because I think that's an important point because we want to say they are authoritative but we also mm -hmm. want to recognize that they don't have the infallibility that you would find in the scriptures. So for example, I'll just read um, the articles of religion, article 21. The authority of article 21. Yeah. It says general councils may not be gathered together without the commandment and will of princes. And when they be gathered together for as much as they be an assembly of men, whereof all be not governed with the spirit and word of God, they may err and sometimes have erred, even in things pertaining unto God. Wherefore, things ordained by them as necessary to salvation have neither strength nor authority, unless it may de be declared that they be taken out of Holy Scripture. Right. That is a beautiful article. And I, and I think it's beautiful because, once again, it roots back to the earliest apostolic witness that we have, which is the teachings of Christ and the apostles, and says that's the standard and if it cannot be rooted there, it cannot be authoritative. But that can lead to these questions, right? Okay, mm -hmm. how do we determine that? How do we come to know that? How do we do that, Jeremiah? Right. I mean, this this goes all the way back to um, just simply looking at the interpretations of the uh, of the article, and and Brown and his commentary on the Thirty Nine Articles is beautiful, spot on with this. Because he, he writes, um, particularly, it is not necessary to spend much time in proving that the primitive church, that is, the church in the first hundred years of the church, um, claimed a certain authority both in matters of ceremony and of faith. It's self-apparent. The first general council of Nicaea was assembled for the express purpose of giving the judgment of the church, represented by the fathers of that council a most important point of doctrine, namely the deity of the Son of God, and on a matter of ceremony, namely the time of keeping Easter. The Epistle of Constantine to the churches, written as it were from the council, urges all Christians to receive the decrees of the bishops so assembled as the will of God. The Father certainly taught that the authority of the church was to be obeyed and received with deep respect. Irenaeus says, where the church is, there is the Spirit of God, but the Spirit is, but the Spirit is truth. Tertullian says, every doctrine is to be judged as false, which is opposed to the truth taught by the churches, apostles, Christ, and God. St. Cyril says, the church is called Catholic because it teaches universally, without omission, all doctrines needful to be known. Passages to the same purport may be abundantly multiplied. But he, and he later on says, to this end they strove, looking for the guidance of the Spirit, following Scripture where it gave them light. On those points on which Scripture was silent, following the rule unanimously adopted at Nicaea, let ancient customs prevail. Yet, 
that the fathers held the authority of scripture to be primary, promise scriptura, and paramount, and considered that the church had no power to enact new articles of faith, nor to decree anything which was contrary to the scriptures, has already been shown sufficiently, and no proof needs to be repeated here. The power of the church they held, not as an authority superior or equal to the scriptures, but as declaratory of them when doubtful and decretory on matters of discipline. So here, the church has the power to enact what the scriptures have already said, to declare what the scriptures have already said plainly, and make decisions where scripture is silent based off of things of faith and in practices of the church. However, they do not have the authority to contradict what is plainly read in scripture. Like nobody could go to the Council of Nicaea and say, well, this plainly shows that Jesus is not God. Jesus plainly says, I'm not God here, you're wrong. These questions were actually brought up to Arius at the Council of Nicaea. Do you have any scripture or fathers to support your claim? Arius couldn't do it. So here in the case of the authority of the church, the church is not able to make new articles of faith, but establish the ones that have already been proclaimed in the scriptures and in the regular fide. This yeah. is why we recite the Apostles' Creed every morning prayer, morning and evening prayer. This is yeah. why we recite the Nicene Creed every Lord's Day, because what we are proclaiming is the faith that has been once for all delivered, proclaimed in scripture, and then decreed and enforced by the Catholic Church. Yeah, beautifully put, brother. Beautifully put. Yeah, and I, I want to, I want to point out that the Church, in in saying in Article Twenty One, that the Church can err in its decision making and in its in its declarations, that is not nullifying the fact that the Church also does possess true, real authority that we as Christians are bound to submit to. And I want to point out that in the later article on the traditions of the church, this is towards the back of the articles, and it can you get it easily missed because some people start reading the articles and they don't get all the way to the end of them. But listen to what it says about ah, the authority. Boring. It's only 39, bro. <laughs> listen to what it says about the authority of the church. It says, whosoever through his private judgment willingly and purposely doth openly break the traditions and ceremonies of the church, which be not repugnant to the word of God and be ordained and approved by common authority ought to be rebuked openly that others may fear to do the like as he that offendeth against the common order of the church and hurteth the authority of the magistrate and woundeth the consciences of the weak brethren. If that, I mean, that's about as explicit as you can get in terms of the authority of the church and, and it possessing a true authority. The only point that Anglicans and reformers were trying to make about the nature and authority of the church was not that the, that the church is subject to the whims and will of man, but that the church is subject to that which came before and has been codified by Holy Scripture and the Catholic creeds mm. and councils that came before it. And when we look at that and we can say this thing right here is in accordance with that and the church declares that we are bound to accept and to follow that. But if the church right. cannot do that, we are to move away. We are to reject that, which is exactly what the reformers were trying to do at the time of the Reformation. Right. I mean, like this, this, oh my goodness, this article, it brings me back to like a comparison because the reformers rightly rejected the um the papal accretions found in in the um in the sacrifice of the mass and and, and many of the accretions added to it however they didn't throw everything off it reminds me of the story of uh of bishop hooper uh hooper not hooker mm. hooper because mm -hmm. when he was ordained to the episcopate and he was going to be ordained as a bishop, he was going to have to wear the surplus, which honestly, when you look at the surplus, it's not necessarily that bad. It's just white cloth. <laughs> but he absolutely refused. He says, I'm not going to wear that papal sacramental stuff. And he caused a ruckus within the English church. 
And so he wrote to the reformers. He wrote to Knox. He wrote to Calvin. He wrote to the king. And you know what? Like specifically, I love this because he wrote to Calvin. And you know what Calvin said? Hmm. Where are the darn surplus? Because you're you're breaking the unity of the church. It's not something that is required for salvation. It's adiaphora. And so if the church decides to do it, just do it. Yeah. So he wore the surplus. And now in England, there is a statue in honor of Richard Hooper wearing the surplus to this day. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's awesome. That's a very cool story. Yeah, that's a that's a perfect example of this. It's It's the idea that... We, we don't have the right or the authority to go up against the judgments of the church when it's not repugnant to scripture. If it's just a personal preference, deal with it. Deal with it and be faithful as a Christian. Um, so, so for example, I'm very high church Anglican. I like all the vestments. I like the incense. I like all the candles. But I've attended some Anglican churches that aren't as keen on on some of these things. They they tend to be a little bit lower church, maybe two candles on the altar instead of six candles, maybe uh, a cassock, a surplus and a tippet instead of a chasuble and, and all of that. And there have been times in the past where I've started to go, why would they not have more? Why are they not? Why? Where's the incense? And I can have this spirit of almost pride in me that judges them based on this very secondary issue. And the reality is mm -hmm. the fact that you can go to an Anglican church that has six candles on an altar and another Anglican church that only has two is a demonstration of the fact that as Anglicans, we try to really only prioritize the essentials of the faith and not the non-essentials. And, and what I mean by that is not that the non-essentials are not important to have discussions about it to talk about, but that they do not make or break the unity of the church. And this is what I love so much about Anglicanism and really the Reformation more broadly, is that it really sought to say, what are the things that are essential for our unity? And in the areas where there isn't agreement, but it's non-essential, we can still commune with one another. We can still gather around the table of our unity together, despite these disagreements. So I've had communion with low mm -hmm. church guys. I've had communion with high church Anglo papalists. I've had communion with Calvinists. I've had communion with moderate Aug Augustinians. And we all gather around the same table every Sunday morning. And what do we do before we come to the table? As Jeremiah pointed out, we recite the creed of the church. And we say, this is what we believe and hold in common. And this is where our shared unity is. And I... I just think that this is one of the most beautiful things about the Reformation that it really brought out is it defined true Catholicity over and against false Catholicity. So yeah. I'd, I'd love you to respond to that and just kind of touch on that idea of true Catholicity versus false Catholicity. Yeah, true, true Catholicity is based not merely on uh, visible, uh, visible appearances. Because Rome will tell you that it has Catholicity because everybody else looks like uh, everybody else looks like they're believing the same things and doing the same things, even though in reality they're not. I mean, just look at the question of whether or not your church has a Latin Mass. Most of the time, it's probably not. Or, or the East says, "Well, we hold to Catholicity. We hold to the ancient practices of the church, but not all of the Orthodox churches do they." because not all of them agree with the same things. Um, but, but true Catholicity is not based upon merely visible things. I mean, because the, the reformers understood, and specifically the Anglican reformers understood, this, this goes all the way back to like the issue of the Episcopacy. They understood that it is proper for the life of the church, for the well-being of the church, and for the, the full essence of the church to keep a tactile, hands-on ordination going all the way back to the apostles. This is why the English church held to the episcopacy. And even reformers like, um, like Luther, like Melanchthon, and Calvin himself were willing to have bishops if England would give them to them. Because they understood that, but they also understood that the highest importance, whether or not you had that tactile, uh, tactile succession, 
was the succession of the faith of the apostles. The English church had both. The, the proper definition of apostolic succession as defined by Irenaeus and Tertullian had both. So when it comes to the issue of having full Catholicity, having full unity, it's not everybody agreeing on the exact same thing, but freedom where there, where Christ has us free and Christ sets us free in the things that we disagree with, but unity on the things that truly matter. Like this is why Anglicanism is at the forefront of ecumenical unity. Like when we look at the Chicago Lambeth quadrilateral, these are the things that Anglicanism has proposed not only to define itself and some of the bare definitions of Anglicanism, but also provides a way of unity for the other churches. What, what's the Lambeth, Chicago Lambeth quadrilateral? Number one, the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as the word of God and containing all things necessary for salvation. Number two, the Apostles' Creed being the baptismal creed of our faith and the Nicene Creed being the full summary of the apostolic faith. Number three, baptism and the Lord's Supper being the, the sacraments ordained of Christ generally necessary for salvation, rightly administered, and number four, the historic episcopate locally adapted. These are the four things that can unite the entire church together. Amen. The Protestant churches, most of the Protestant churches have the first three. What they're lacking is the fourth. The, uh, the, the, ap the other apostolic churches have three of them. What they're missing is the full acknowledgement as the scriptures being uh, containing all things generally necessary for salvation. If we could each concede on some of the things that we disagree with and come together on these four things, we can have a true Catholic church again. We could have true unity again. And we can, we can debate on the things that are incredibly important, incredibly important, things like justification, things like the doctrine of salvation, things like the issue of images, all of these other things, especially the issue of women's ordination. Oh my goodness. Yep. We need to talk about that, but we can talk about that as a church, as a yeah. full church, which is the same church that we proclaim every single time we recite the creed, one holy Catholic and apostolic. This is the way to do it. This yep. is the way we can do it. If only we get off of our high horses and, and kneel before our holy God and, and understand that this is what we need to do in order to answer Christ's prayer in John 17, that we may be one, even as Christ and the Father is one. That's what we need to do. Yeah. Amen to that. Amen to that, brother. And I, I, think, I think you draw out a really, really good point, not just about the unity of the church and the potential for unity of the church, but also about the the true Catholicity and beauty, beauty of the Anglican tradition specifically. Um, I think Anglicanism can oftentimes be caricatured as like a stepping stone to Rome or a stepping stone to Orthodoxy, um, or as like for Protestants that want to be a little higher church, but don't want to go all the way, that kind of thing. Anglicanism, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm going to say this as strongly as I possibly can, Anglicanism is, in my mind, the fullness of the Catholic faith. Full stop. Anglicanism is the fullness of the Catholic faith. It possesses everything that I believe, looking at history, looking at tradition, looking at the scriptures, encompasses and encapsulates everything that the Catholic faith is. And so I'm not an Anglican because I'm a Roman Catholic wannabe that doesn't want to go too far. I'm an Anglican mm. because I really do believe this is not just the fullness of the Catholic faith, but this is the very means by which the faith, once for all delivered to the saints, will once again unite the church. Um, and I, I really believe this. I'm not a prophet. I'm not making any claims, but I truly believe that the existence of the Anglican communion as that kind of via media, sometimes said between Protestantism and Rome, sometimes said between the Lutherans and Geneva, regardless of where you want to define that via media, the fact that Anglicanism does function as a via media to me says God has placed Anglicans in the world as potentially a means to unite the church in the future. I really do believe that. Um, and Amen. so I just, I want to encourage Anglicans who are watching this because I, I get a lot of messages. I don't know about you, Jeremiah, in this area, but 
I get a lot of messages from people that are really, really struggling with the disunity of the church and even within Anglicanism, the messiness and the fracturing and the heterodoxy that's come in. And they say like, where should I just go to Rome? Like, I don't know where to go. This looks so messy. And I just want this, like, really hear me. Anglicanism is an important communion in the history of the church. And I don't believe we've begun to see the, the way in which God is going to use our communion to heal Christendom. And so Amen. be faithful, be encouraged. What we have as Anglicans in the Book of Common Prayer and the 39 Articles is beautiful. It's beautiful. Amen. And, and like, I, I come across these, these sorts of things, sorts of things too, where it's like, there's so much this unity, there's so many things wrong. Am I supposed to go to Rome? And, and I ask them, what are you looking for? Are you looking for a perfect church, which is mainly what they're looking for? Or are you looking to a place, to a church where the gospel is preached and you hear God's words of comfort given to you? Because mm -hmm. this is the heart of the Reformation, especially in the Reformation in England. Is the Anglican Church, or is the church wherever you go to, a place where you can hear the words of God and like Bilney, let your bruised bones leap for joy? Mm -hmm. Is that where you hear Jesus's comfortable words, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you hear the words that Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief? And that if you sin, you have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who's the propitiation for your sins and not for yours only, but the sins of the whole world. Do you hear that? Mm. Because that's what I hear in Anglicanism. That's what I hear whenever I pray. In the prayer book. That's what I hear preached to me when I read the homilies, when I hear the gospel preached in the homilies. That's what I read when I read the 39 articles. The formularies of the Anglican Church are formulated in order to preach comfort, to confess comfort, and to pray that comfort. Mm. Yeah. Are you comfortable? with the words of Christ in your church. You're not looking for a perfect church because if you are, <laughs> you should be dead <laughs> because the you, the perfect church is the church triumphant. Nay, not even the church triumphant, the church consummated. We're here on earth. We're dealing with sinners and sinners are messy people. Mm -hmm. If you think that the early church was perfect, you are wrong. <laughs> but Indeed. these fallen people, these imperfect people, learned to live with one another under a common faith, under a common confession, under the faith once delivered, under the preaching of the gospel and the right administration of the sacraments. Yeah. That's what you should look for. Yep. And that's what I find in the Anglican communion. And I believe yeah. that's what you should continue to find in the Anglican communion. People mess up. People are terrible, but God is good. And he is able to overcome everything. When when life gets you down and when life pulls back the curtain and then the, the sorrows of the Anglican church pull back the curtain for you, I want you to see the cross of Christ and him hanging on it saying, I love you nonetheless. Hmm. That is what's found in the Anglican communion. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, and I, I think too that like sometimes people when they – when they approach Anglicanism and the Anglican communion, they can have the tendency to say, okay, like where, where's your confession of faith? Where's the document that tells me what you believe? And we do have that in the 39 articles, but I sometimes think we need to move away from saying, Oh, 39 articles, go read that. No, 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 no. If you want to know what we believe, watch how we pray, <laughs> watch us pray. That's, that is, that is the Anglican identity. That is the fundamental nature of Anglicanism is it's not so much an intellectualized faith. And I, I'm not trying to say other traditions are all intellectualized, but I think some of them do tend to be more on the intellectualized side of things. Um, I, I heard a priest say once that if, if the reform traditions um, in Geneva tend to be emphasizing the priesthood of all believers, the Anglican tradition 
was trying to emphasize the monkhood of all believers. And I think there's some truth Hmm. to that because really the prayer life of the Anglican church is robust, profound, and incredible in the way that it builds out of the, the, the divine liturgy on Sunday, it builds into the rest of the week, this continued pattern of liturgical life and living through the daily office. And what that affords us to do is to not just hear the gospel preached to us, us on Sundays, but to hear the gospel proclaimed to us every single day of the week, morning and evening. And I love, get this, in the daily office, when you pray morning prayer, the very first thing that you do is you confess your sins. And the very next thing that you hear are the words of comfort, as Jeremiah was saying. When you come to the evening of your day, the very first thing you do is confess your sins. And the very next thing is you hear those words of comfort. And you do that every day. And then on Sunday, you go to church. And guess what you do? You confess your sins. You hear the words, the comfort, and you receive the Holy Eucharist. This is the Anglican pattern of life. It's repentance, confession, and hearing the good news of the gospel. And just reveling in that. And so, just as Jeremiah said... My goodness, if that is not enough, you don't understand the Christian faith. If that is yes. not enough, you don't understand the Christian faith. Um, I, I, I think, oh man, yeah. I, I, mean, I just it, want, it, I want to let is... that sit for a second because that is so profoundly important. And that, that really gets to the heart of the Reformation right there. Here's the gospel. Look at it. Behold it. And let's behold it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and let's remove anything that obscures that. That's the Reformation in a nutshell. And when you go to an Anglican service, you're like, man, there's a whole lot of gospel here all the time. And that just yes, is like... I mean, it's it's so good. It's like, um, oh, man, this this last semester, I was taking Anglican history and doctrine with my professor, Dr. Jonathan Lineball. Absolutely amazing professor professor and what he what he said was sometimes he goes to some churches and and people say well what do you do here it's like we give you jesus we let you know that you need jesus and here's jesus and they say well what else well you do it in the morning you need jesus here's jesus (laughs) well what else what else is there jesus is enough we are continually reminded I need Jesus. Here's Jesus. I need Jesus. Here's Jesus. This is what we need every single day of our lives. It's the daily gospel. And that's what we continue to proclaim every single day. If you want something more, you're not looking for Jesus because Jesus is more than you could ever need. And he's more than you could ever want because he is the satisfaction of all of us. Just as, just as first Corinthians says, he is our salvation. He is our propitiation, our sanctification and redemption. So that everything that we do, we don't boast in anyone but God. That's that's the heart of it. That's the heart of the yeah. Christian faith. Christ and him crucified. I don't want to know anything else. Yeah. Amen. And I, and I think, too, that a lot of times when we're, if we're talking about like the disunity, because one of the things that, and this is a huge Roman Catholic polemic against Protestant, you guys with your 35,000 denominations and that, you know, number is obviously false, but it gets, it gets pointed out. There's a lot of disunity and on a very surface level, they're right. Protestantism has a lot more divisions and denominations than you would find in Rome. And so we do have to deal with that and, and answer that. But I think one of the things that I have learned reading church history that I've started to become more comfortable with is the kinds of divisions that you see in true Protestantism And the reason I want to say true Protestantism is there's a lot of breakoff groups that have come from the Reformation that are not really in any real sense associated with or part of magisterial Protestantism at all in any in any sense. So true Protestantism, the differences between them are rather minor. They're rather minor. And not just that, but when you go back and you read the early church and you read all the various fathers you're going to find strong agreement on certain things and completely conflicting agreement on other things. There's a lot of disagreement. And when you look at that and you compare that to the state of Protestantism today, you go, the early church actually looked pretty similar in terms of the level of unity and disunity that they had. And so I just want to say that as a comfort to say, 
what we are seeing is actually not unusual in the nature of the church. And what I find beautiful is that when I wake up on a Sunday morning and go to church and I confess the Nicene Creed, I'm confessing that with brothers and sisters around the world that I have tons of disagreement with. And yet we're united around that. And so I think what Rome has done, and even orthodoxy, maybe to a lesser extent, but still to a pretty large extent, they've defined Catholicity in such a narrow way that anything outside of that appears to be disunited and and lacking Catholicity. But the only reason it looks that way is if we're using Roman orthodoxy as a litmus test for what is and what isn't Catholic. If we refuse to do that and we put that to the side and we look back, as we've been talking about, to the early fathers, to the apostolic witness of the scriptures and the creeds and the councils, what we're going to see is actually, I think, a far more united Christendom than we ever thought, truly. So do you want to touch on that, Jeremiah? Yeah, I mean, if if we if I've I've said this already, but if we broaden our scope of what it means to be Catholic, not just simply, hey, do you agree with these particular things? Um, because they weren't the way that it was defined in relation to the first six hundred years of the church. If if we look at both Rome and the East, they have added doctrines to their uh, to their theology after the great split. And because of that, they cannot rightly call themselves Catholic. But if we go back to the bare definitions that were found in the first few hundred years of the church, which the Anglicans do, there they can properly be called Catholic. This is again why I, along with you, Jonah, believe that Anglicanism is the proper expression and true, truest expression of the Catholic faith. If we go back to that standard, Go back to the standard that I proposed in relation to reading Lancelot Andrews. We'll find unity. We'll find Catholicity. And we can yeah. actually move on in, in proclaiming the gospel as a unified body. Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox. All of us yeah. as one church. I think that's the way to do it. Yeah, amen. And, and, to, and to that point, I want to I wanna go back to Article 34 that... that I was using earlier to talk about the the traditions and the the problem with breaking the traditions of the church. One of the things it says at the at the beginning, which I really really love, is that it is not necessary that traditions and ceremonies be in all places one and utterly like, for at all times they have been diverse and may be changed according to the diversities of countries, times, and men's manners, so that nothing be ordained against God's word. And the reason that I want to bring this mm. up is when we're talking about a united church, what that looks like, and us talking about Anglicanism as being really the, the portrait and picture of the possibility of that. What we're not saying is that there couldn't be churches that are still using Latin in their masses, and that the Orthodox have to change their Byzantine rite, or, or that the Presbyterians have to change fundamentally their, their own liturgical heritage. None of that is what we're saying. We're not saying everybody needs to leave their place in Christendom and become Anglican. What we're saying is that the principles that guide and govern Anglicans found in, like Jeremiah demonstrated earlier in the Chicago uh, Lambeth Quadrilateral, when, when we take that picture and we inf basically have agreed upon consensus surrounding it within the church, what you're going to find is proper latin masses proper byzantine masses proper anglican masses proper presbyterian masses although they wouldn't be presbyterian if they accept the episcopate anymore but, <laughs> they wouldn't call it a mass, pro but. proper <laughs> proper yeah geneva uh heritage geneva scottish services. heritage yeah yeah exactly <laughs> services masses whatever what we're going to see though is we're going to see all of these particular heritages and traditions and ways of life maintained under this banner of unity that Anglicanism can provide to, to the Catholic Church. And so rather than saying everybody needs to drop what they're doing and join with us and become Anglican, what we're saying is everybody needs to join around the essentials of the Catholic faith. And then as one church, we can talk more about our agreements and disagreements and work through things. And even say, hey, yeah. 
we agree to disagree on this, but that doesn't change the fact that we're in union with one another as brothers. Um, and so I think that that's very important. And this article highlights the fact that traditions and ceremonies can be different from place to place without disrupting the Catholicity and the oneness of the church. You're exactly right. I, I, I love that, that article because, oh man, I, as someone who is more Anglican minded and uh, serves in a Presbyterian church, I get miffed so much because the liturgy is not the same as uh, some something that is more high church. I I sometimes attend uh, Christ Church Anglican, and it is it is very high church, um, and so the contrast is very plain because my my teaching elder is a Puritan to the max, and so. We, we get to a point where we can't have anything translated in Latin because it might seem too Catholic. Sure. So that, that sort of difference is, is amazing. And so for me, I fully, I fully see that, that unity and diversity, even though I have a particular preference. And of course, I'm definitely going to try my best to bring up the, the status of worship and the standard of worship in that congregation while I'm there. But I still realize but that I'm not going to turn this into an Anglican mass. And I don't have to. I don't need to. Because it is still in that church. The gospel is rightly preached. The sacraments rightly administered. And the people there are hearing God's words of love and grace in Jesus Christ to them. If we understood that, then our worship wars would be a lot less bloody, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. And I think, too, that it also highlights that one of the things that will have to happen in the union of the church is not so much, like you just mentioned, a giving up of all the things that are particular to our our heritage and the things that we've inherited, but it will be a recognition of the validity of one another. Um, I, I think one of the problems that we see is not necessarily so much, I'm very proud of my tradition. That's fine. That's good. That's to be expected. But sometimes what we see is, I'm proud of my tradition and anything else is trash. <laughs> and I think that that is the mentality that needs to be pushed back upon as we seek for a united church. We can yeah. be proud of our liturgy, but we need to appreciate the Catholicity of other liturgies. And we need to see that, hey, even if this doesn't resonate with me in the same way, or this is not the way that I was raised or the kind of tradition I find myself in. If we can see Christ proclaimed in there and we can see the gospel and we can have the sacraments, then I think we need to simply say, this is beautiful in its own way and move on. Um, Amen. Jeremiah, I, I want to, I want to move a little bit and, and change the, the, the tone, the turn or the subject matter specifically to talk a little bit in particular about some of the doctrines of the reformation, specifically mm -hmm. the ones that get pushed back. And they're like, that's not, that doesn't seem Catholic to me. And so the big ones would be justification by faith alone. You'll see people say the father's never taught this. You don't see that. So I want to talk a little bit about the Catholicity of that doctrine. I also sure. want to talk a little bit with you about um, the, the sola scriptura or prima scriptura, as I prefer. A lot of people, right. that's not Catholic. And then the third and last one would be a little bit on the sacrificial nature of the Eucharist. A lot of right. people push back strongly. And in fact, Rome, their condemnation of Anglican orders comes from this idea that you as Anglicans reject the sacrificial nature of the Eucharist. So I want to talk about those three things a little bit with you and just demonstrate that Anglicans in particular, uh, but maybe the Reformation more broadly as well, has not abandoned the Catholic faith in their particular uh, articulations of these things. So let's start with uh, justification. Yeah, justification, justification by faith alone. Um, the the reformers argued vehemently for this doctrine. It was one of these central things that they held, um, and they they argued not that it was a departure from the church, but if you actually read the the articles, because the articles mention primarily this particular homily, 
And if you read the homilies, homilies two and three, on the salvation of all mankind, which is the homily on justification, and the homily on a true and lively faith, you will see that there is an entire section, an entire section on quotations from the fathers and proof from the fathers on this issue. Yeah. Uh, particularly, uh, I want to I want to look primarily at the homily on justification. Because this one is so so beautiful, I read this. Um, I read this sermon to uh, to my friends of mine during um, uh, during All Saints Day and during All Hallows Eve, because it's it's just it's just so good. Um, part of the section is says this: the faith only justifies is the doctrine of the old uh, doctrine of the old doctors. And after this, wise, to be justified only by this true and lively faith in Christ, speaks all of the old and ancient authors, both Greeks and Latins, of whom I will specifically rehearse three, Hilary, Basil, and Ambrose. St. Hilary saith these words plainly in the ninth canon upon Matthew, faith only justifies. And St. Basil, a Greek author, writes thus, this is a perfect and whole rejoicing in God when a man advances not himself for his own righteousness, but acknowledges himself to lack true justice and righteousness, and to be justified by the only faith in Christ. And Paul saith he, doth glory in the contempt of his own righteousness, and that he looks for the righteousness of God by faith. That's his commentary on Philippians 3.9. These be the very words of St. Basil, and St. Ambrose, a Latin author, saith these words, This is the ordinance of God, that they which believe in Christ should be saved without works, by faith only, freely receiving remission of their sins. Consider diligently these words, Without works, by faith only, freely we receive remission of our sins. What can be spoken more plainly than to say that freely, without works, by faith only, we retain remission of our sins? These and other like sentences that we be justified by faith only, freely, and without works, we do read oftentimes in the most best and ancient writers. As beside Hilary, Basil, and St. Ambrose before rehearsed, we read the same in Origen. Chrysostom, Cyprian, Augustine, Prosper, Ocumenus, Phocius, Bernardus, Anselm, and many other authors, both Greek and Latin. So we, we see not only in Cranmer, but we see it all over in uh, the Apology of, of the Church of England by John Jewell, and also in one of the most, it's the smallest in my opinion, but it's the most beautiful treatise on justification that I've read Richard so Hooker. far. Richard Hooker's That's Alerted right. Discourse on Justification. That's brilliant. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's brilliant. Because it discusses yeah. the the agreements that we have with Rome, the disagreements that we have, and the, the fullest expression of that found within the early fathers. We believe that this doctrine is patristic. Yeah. We believe that it is. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, and I, I just uh, want to – oh, go ahead. No, no, please. No, I was I was just going to say, I think that a lot of times uh, the doctrine of justification by faith alone gets caricatured. And I'm just going to raise up my hands and say, and I was guilty of this as I started to move into more patristic readings and stuff. I I gave a horrible caricature of it and said, oh, man, we're not justified by faith alone. Look at all this emphasis on, on things like love and, and works and stuff within the church fathers. Couldn't possibly. Mm -hmm. When you read the homilies on justification, what you will see very clearly is that there there's a, almost an overemphasis at times on the fact that the virtue of charity must be present in the believer, that works must be present in the life of a believer. Like it's so clear that you cannot be justified without these things. However, yep. the ground of our justification is faith only. That is the only yep. point that these authors are making. Not that love is not going to be present, not that works are not going to flow from this, and that those things aren't necessary as part of the Christian life, but that the grounds and basis of our justification is in nothing else but faith. And when you understand it that way, and you start to <laughs> move past this idea that faith alone means the only thing that you need as a Christian is faith, and as long as you have that, nothing else matters— when you leave that caricature behind, it really is a beautiful doctrine, and it squares picture perfectly with the faith of the ancient church. And so, yeah, I have no problem with the doctrine of justification by faith alone. 
I just have problem with certain articulations that have moved away from that of the original reformers and articulations of it that completely neglect the wider context in which the fathers of the Anglican Church and others were were framing this discussion. Um, and, and just as kind of a side note, too, you find this with a lot of different doctrines of the Reformation. It's not just with justification by faith alone. So, for example, Calvinism, huge caricatures around Calvinism, that it means this, and in a lot of pop kind of level apologetics within some of the more reformed baptistic type traditions you do see certain articulations of calvinism that are a bit off in terms of their continuity with church history but when you read calvin when you read vermigli when you read a lot of these early reformers cranmer on predestination election and all of that and then you go back even to the medieval period and read thomas aquinas it's like the continuity is profound there's it's nothing so new clear. there at all. And so I really just want to challenge people as we continue this discussion. It is so easy to read polemics from the Roman Catholic side. It's so easy to read polemics from the Protestant side and to create caricatures about what these doctrines mean on a surface level that are simply not true. And as I have learned from my own mistakes, when you go and you start reading the actual sources, you read the homilies, you read the Book of Common Prayer, you read the writings of these reformers and the way in which they articulate these doctrines. Sure, you may still come away disagreeing, but you cannot say that they were pulling this stuff out of thin air. They are trying to be faithful to the apostolic witness of the fathers, the creeds, and the councils, as we discussed earlier. And once you see that, and you see that continuity, the Catholicity of these doctrines actually shine. <laughs> um, so just wanted to say that. No, you're, you're exactly right, brother. And, and that, that sort of flows into what we believe about the doctrine of scripture. As we, as we see in article six um, of the, of the articles of faith, that, that the scriptures proclaim all things necessary to salvation, that everything that we need for life and godliness in relation to the salvation of our souls is found within Holy Scripture, and the scriptures are sufficient for that purpose. We, we find these sorts of things in the, in the Holy Fathers, because um, Brown, in his exposition of the 39 Articles, he quotes the primitive fathers in favor of the Anglican rule and not of the Roman. He says, Irenaeus says, we know that the scriptures are perfect as being spoken by the word of God and his spirit by Christ and his spirit. Again, we have received the disposition of our salvation by none others, but those whom the gospel came to us, which they then preached and afterwards by God's will delivered to us in the scriptures to be the pillar and ground of our faith. That's Irenaeus's uh, work against heresies, uh, book three, chapter one. I remember that because I use this article all the time against Muslims. Um, Tertullian says, I adore the perfection of scripture, which declares to me the creator and his works, whether all things were made of preexistent matter, as I have as yet nowhere read. But the school of Hermogenes show that it is written. If it is not written, let them fear the woe, which is destined for them who add to or take away. Yeah. Origen says the two testaments in which every word that appertains to God may be sought out and discussed, and from them all knowledge of things may be understood, if anything remain which Holy Scripture does not determine, no third scripture ought to be had recourse to. But that which remains, must commit. we must commit to the fire, that is, reserve it unto God. For God would not have us know all things in this world. Athanasius, he writes, the holy and divinely inspired scripture are of themselves sufficient to the enunciation of truth. Again, these are the fountains of salvation that he who thirsts may be satisfied with the oracles contained in them. In these alone, the doctrine of salvation is contained. Let no man add to or take away from them. And then finally, Augustine, in those things which are plainly laid down in scripture, all things are found which embrace faith and morals. There are more that I could quote, but I think these are already sufficient to note that the fathers understood that the scriptures were sufficient for all things necessary to salvation. Yeah, I, I to, yeah, total, totally agreed. And I, I think if we just use a basic, like, 
logic, if we just use some logic and we say, okay, when it comes to discerning the truth of the gospel message, what will be the most reliable source to do so? What will be like the ground and standard upon which all else is built? It seems a bit more plausible that that would be found in the words directly from our Lord and his apostles than anybody else. <laughs> right. So if we just say that that makes the most sense, then that will obviously lead us to say that scripture must be the standard for all things. And what's very interesting, I, 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 I heard this quote in a Gavin Ortland video the other day, so I pulled it up again because it's just such a good one. One of the things you hear is, if you don't know where to turn, turn to the church. You know, the church has got you. Um, and if, if you're confused by all the different denominations, you know, that's what Rome has come to save you from. We're the one true church. You can listen to everything we say. This is what St. John Chrysostom says when yes. somebody's discerning, where do I go? He says this, quote, what then shall we say to the heathen? There comes a heathen and says, I wish to become a Christian, but I know not whom to join. There's much fighting and faction among you, much confusion. Which doctrine am I to choose? How then shall we answer him? Each one of you, says he, asserts, I speak the truth. No doubt, this is in our favor. For if we told you to be persuaded by arguments, you might well be perplexed. But if we bid you to believe the scriptures, and these are simple and true, the decision is easy for you. For if any agree with the scripture, the scriptures, he is a Christian. If any fight against them, he is far from this rule. So Chrysostom assumes the perspicuity of scripture, first of all, that's very clear in that quote. But he also yeah. assumes that somebody who is looking at all the divisions in the church can discern the truth from the scriptures alone. Now, that is not to say that that is the only thing that we have to guide us to the truth. The church acts as a pillar and foundation of the truth by upholding the teachings of scriptures, by elucidating the doctrines of scriptures for us, by codifying things and showing us the interpretations of scriptures throughout the ages. So we have that, but that is a vehicle rather than the foundation. And, and, and so it's very, very important. And that quote from Chrysostom is profound in showing here's an ancient church father that's venerated in both the Eastern church and the Roman church, who is very, very clearly stating that if you want to know where the truth is, you have to go back to scripture before anything else. Um, and so if that doesn't vindicate, uh, I don't know what else will. <laughs> I love that. Like he, he lists the same argument proposed by the Romans. It's like, yeah. well, if you're going to become a Christian, which church should you join? You're all divided. And instead of saying, well, just, just join my church. He says, go to scripture, determine it from scripture and then go where scripture leads. It's the exact yeah. same thing that we say. Right. So, I mean, in, in this sort of question, is is Chrysostom a Roman Catholic or is he a Protestant? Well, right. we know that yeah. he's Catholic, but the question is whether he's Roman or not. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And again, I just I just want to point out, because I think somebody could read that quote and then very easily come away with the conclusion, conclusion. Is Chrysostom just saying that every man's to take his Bible, run off, and determine for themselves what the truth is? That's not what he's saying. No. All that he's saying is that the ground of determining this truth is the scriptures and nothing else. That's the only point. And when we grasp that and understand that, we can have a proper view of the church, its authority, and its traditions throughout the ages in light of the role of scripture and where that stands in terms of the hierarchy between the two. Um, I, I'd like to move, and, and then I have some kind of closing remarks, but I want to talk a little bit about the sacrificial nature of yes. the mass, as it was called. Um, in article 31, we have a condemnation of the sacrifices of masses in which it was commonly said that the priest did offer Christ for the quick and the dead to have remission of pain and guilt. And these are called blasphemous fables and dangerous deceits by our Anglican forefathers. And so clearly there's a mm -hmm. condemnation of the sacrifices of masses but is this necessarily a condemnation of all sacrificial language surrounding the Eucharist? And can we find continuity in Catholicity with the ancient church, which very clearly did use sacrificial language to talk about the Eucharist? Oh, most definitely, yes. The church used sacrificial language in order to express the Eucharist. And 
And one of the main emphases that they use in relation to the sacrifice is that it's a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Because that's the one that's found in scripture. And even in offering of the Eucharist, we're not offering Christ. We're offering ourselves as, as, as those who are made in the service of God. And even then, in relation to the doctrine of transubstantiation, they note that there is a sacramental change in the elements. However, the bread is still bread and the wine is still wine. But they also confess that it is also in its substance the body and blood of Christ. The Anglican churches have always confessed these things as well. Vermigli says that there is a change, a sacramental change in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bootser says that there is a sacramental change in the Eucharist. When you read uh, Cranmer's defense of the Catholic doctrine of the Lord's Supper, he notes that it is both the body and blood of Christ and still bread and wine. How does that happen? We don't know because it's a mystery. It's called a sacrament for a reason. It, 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 the, the word sacrament comes from the Latin word sacramentum, which comes from the, the Greek word mysterion, which means mystery. We don't know right. how it happens. Right. But God makes it happen so that we confess that it is the sacrifice of Christ made present to us. It's an anamnesis, which means that it is not only a mental reminder but it's us participating in the exact same way that Christ invited his disciples to start to participate in with him in the very first establishment of the Lord's Supper and where we partake of Christ, where where Christ is in us and we are in him. We, yeah. There is koinonia. There is connection. There is communion. So there is a real substantial communion, but it is after a spiritual and heavenly manner. That doesn't mean that it's not real. Right. That just means that we're not eating Christ capernaically, where somebody's eating a, a, a piece of Christ's skin and somebody's eating a piece of Christ's bone. Right. Where it says that that we truly partake of Christ, body, soul, blood, and divinity, through the means of bread and wine. And the reason why they use that language is because, number one, they're arguing against the, the, the issue of capernaic eating, but they're also – maintaining the very meaning of a sacrament. Now, what is a sacrament? A sacrament is a visible sign which points to an invisible reality. And like Jonah, what is the best example that we could have for a sacrament in relation hmm. to redemptive history? The cross. Yes, but who's on the cross? Jesus. Christ, the very incarnation, is the very definition of a sacrament because there right. you have a truly visible sign, but contained within it is the very grace of God, grace incarnate. Mm -hmm. So when Christ takes on human flesh, when the thing signified goes within the sign or partakes with the sign, it doesn't eliminate the substance of the sign. That's right. Christ is still in his human nature, body, soul, and spirit. However, through the means of the physical body, the very grace of the Logos is communicated to us in the person of Christ. And then the exact same way, that same sacramental reality is given within the sacraments because Christ himself says, this is my body. So right. in the visible, substantial, and real forms of bread and wine, there is the inward spiritual grace of the body and blood of Christ given to the people, and we rightly receive it. And it is right. received because Christ is not – Christ is objectively there, but he is received by faith. He is rightly received by the faithful. And the, the – as Augustine saith in relation to those who, who eat the sacrament but do not eat the body and blood of Christ, they press the bread with their teeth, but they do not truly partake of the grace of Christ found objectively within the sacrament. This is what the reformers have long time preached. That's the full meaning that is found within the 39 articles. I, I, don't, I don't know how quickly I can stress it enough. The reformers and authors of the 39 articles, Cranmer and Matthew Parker, were not Zwinglians. <laughs> yeah. They never would be. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's an amazing, amazing summation. And I think that's so important to, to emphasize that incarnational reality. Sorry, I, I answered the cross. I didn't know where you were going with that. So. But yeah, no, you're fine. I, mean, I, I, I love, I love doing, that. I love doing that because it, it throws everyone <laughs> for a loop, and I love it when it happens. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but the incarnation is so important to emphasize because this is really 
the reason transubstantiation was rejected and the reason that they were so concerned about preserving the sign and the thing signified was because they were seeking to preserve the incarnational reality of the Eucharist. And when we look at our own lives and we look at the kind of idea of participation in the divine nature, as St. Peter says in, in, the, in his second letter in the first chapter, what does it mean for us to participate in the divine nature? Well, it means that our humanity is in a real sense deified. And St. Athanasius talks about this. You find this in the early church. That language is not not to be taken in a Mormon way. I'll put it that way. It, it's, it's a very patristic language that simply means that our human selves, by being united to Jesus Christ, are being elevated to participate in God. And the more and more that we become like him, the greater an extent our capacity is to put away sin, to put away the deeds of darkness, and to become conformed fully to the image of Christ. And so when we look at the Eucharist, you have the natural matter of bread and wine, and you have the supernatural matter of Christ's body and blood. And the bread and wine, and I think this is very important, I try to articulate it this way to show the difference between kind of Rome's idea. Rather than a descent and containment, which is kind of the idea, that Christ descends and he's now contained under the accidents of bread and wine. The bread and wine are actually the things that are transfigured. They are elevated to participate. And in us taking them in, we are also elevated to participate. And so mm. rather than the substance of something being changed, the substance of the bread and the wine actually become more fully bread and wine, the truest bread and wine that you could possibly partake in. And just as we... Yeah in participating in Christ become not less human such that our substance is removed, but more and more human. This is the parallel and this is the kind of theological emphasis that our articles have and that our, uh, our uh, reformers were really trying to get at. And, and, and to your point about spiritual not meaning less real, I just want us to pause and recognize that we have extremely physical descriptions of Christ's resurrection. He stood with the disciples, they touched him, he ate with them. He even says to them, could a mere spirit do this? <laughs> He's very clear, exactly. it's a physical resurrection. And yet, St. Paul calls his body a spiritual body. A spiritual body. And so if we look at that and we go, okay, the realest human who's ever existed, which is the glorified Jesus Christ, is a spiritual body then that means that it would be a downgrade for us to say that we are eating the carnal physical Christ. I want nothing of carnality. I want the spiritual Jesus who is going to take my lowly body and make it like his glorious body. And so Preach. when we frame it that way, my goodness, this becomes beautiful language to describe the sacrament rather than a kind of moving away from something more tangible and more real. It becomes the most real reality that there possibly is. I also think, too, going back to kind of that idea of the sacrificial nature, I think it's important that our reformers in Article 31 did made, made the sacrifices of masses plural. They were very right. intentional in the way that they worded things. Their concern was not about a sacrifice of the mass which is the presentation of the signs that signify the reality of Christ's once for all sacrifice made present for us. There's no problem there. What they were trying to get away from was this idea of a repetitive sacrifice of Calvary, that Christ is being repeatedly offered for the living and the dead. And I think it's very, very important that we, that we look at the fact that it says, the sacrifices of the message in which it was commonly said that the priest did offer Christ for the quick and the dead. I think the word offer there is very important. The, the priest is offering Christ for the living and the dead. That is being condemned. And the reason it's being condemned is that Christ offered himself once. No priest offers Christ repeatedly for the living and the dead. The only thing that the priest does is he participates in the representation of the once for all offering of Christ, which is then given to the faithful and received by faith. And so the condemnation surrounds the kind of plurality, which leads into the condemnation of, of like, uh, you know, 
kind of the solitary nature of the mass where you have private masses going on where priests are gathered around these tiny little altars all over the, the over and over and Chantries. over offering Christ. Yeah. There's no real holy communion taking place there. The only thing that's taking place there is besides idolatry, the the repetitive sacrificing of Christ. And that is what the reformers were looking at and saying, Oh, no more of this. And I think we sometimes forget that this was the context because that kind of thing has become not fully eliminated from Rome, but less prevalent. They've adopted a lot of kind of the reformational understanding that communion should be done, you know, in communion with one another. But that is the context. That's what's being condemned. And when we when we look at that, we have a very Catholic view of the sacrificial nature of the Eucharist, as well as how Christ is present to us and how we come to participate more deeply in him. Jeremiah, as we wrap this up, I, I just want to ask you one final question, which is, if there are people watching or listening to this that are struggling with some of the divisions within the church and just struggling to make sense of it all and are looking towards the really honestly enticing claims of Rome and the East, which is we are perfect We've got everything you could possibly need. We are never going to err or go astray. You can trust and rest easy with us. And that's looking really appealing. What would you say to them to say, hey, you should remain a Protestant? Right. And, and when somebody says that, what I always tell them is when something sounds too good to be true, probably is. It probably is. Like I said earlier, no church is perfect. No church is perfect. So if you're looking for a perfect church, you're never going to find it here on earth. What you want to look for is where the gospel is preached, where the sacraments are rightly instituted. There's the true church. And if you want to argue for apostolic succession being the means by which the gospel is preached and the sacraments rightly administered, Protestantism still got it. Whether through tactile, um, tactile apostolic succession or the proper explanation of the apostles' teaching. It's there. You have it already here. Yep. And so go to the things that truly matter. Perfection will happen in eternity because perfection is God's work, not yours. Your duty is to hear the word of God and partake of Christ. That's what he has ordained for you. And that's what that's what I've been doing. That's one of the things that's been leading me to the Anglican Communion. You don't have to be Anglican in order to do this, but I believe this is where God is calling me. Because it, it was amazing because I, I, I fully is established this particular emphasis in March 21st. It's the, it's the anniversary of, of, of Thomas Ken. Hmm. And it's amazing because Thomas Ken says this, and I'll probably close with this. He, he said this on his deathbed. I die, and now for me, therefore I live in the holy Catholic and apostolic faith professed by the whole church before the division of East and West. More particularly, I die, or for me, I live in communion of the Church of England, as it stands distinguished from all papal and Puritan innovations. That's what you want. You want where the gospel is preached and where the innovations are lessened to the extent that there should be none. That's where you should go. Go to where Jesus is, because where Jesus is, there is the church. Hmm. Amen, brother. Thank you so much for coming on and having this discussion with me. It was great to talk to you again after uh, a hiatus of having a regular conversation. Uh, so it was it was a pleasure, and I, I pray people are edified by this conversation.